name's Madeleine Ogilvy. Um, I'm a lawyer by trade. I've travelled and worked all over the world. Um, but I was most recently a Labor member for Denison in the Tasmanian State Parliament. And that's a bit of a family tradition. So we've been here, um, our family's been here on one side of the family for about six generations, a long time. Um, and we have made a big contribution, I think, to lots of things, but one of the important things is access to Mount Wellington. Well, Mount Wellington is um, very much in the hearts of people who live in Hobart. It's very wild and free and uh, a very exciting place to go and visit. And People in Tasmania feel very passionately about their conservation areas and their, their parks. Mount Wellington in particular, of course, um, wasn't really accessible for everybody, for the people, until the road was built up the mountain in the 1930s. So my grandfather and my great uncle were both Labor members of Parliament back in the 1930s. My great uncle was the Premier and my grandfather was the Attorney General back then. And they did a series of big projects um, because it was the era of the Great Depression and they wanted to get people working and to build things up in Tasmania. So they started things like the tourism industry, the paper making industry, they built all of the state schools and one of the projects that uh, they were very keen on was um, to build the road up the mountain and that was because it employed a lot of people and employing people and giving those men the work, real work, uh, to build a road that could then be used by everybody for free access to the mountain for all time was really dear to their hearts so that's how that project started. And the road up the mountain, we all call it the road up the mountain, but um, it's called Pinnacle Road, that's its official title. But it used to be called Ogilvy Scar, which is a, um, a pejorative term or a term, you know, of uh, um, a less favourable term. And the reason they called it that was when it was being built, of course, they had to cut some trees down to build that road. It was a very difficult road to build. Hundreds of men worked on that road. And when it was first carved into the mountain, it was very visible, zigzag pattern. But now, of course, over time, those trees have, have grown up. And so it's very hard to see it, except at night, when you see the twinkling lights of the cars as people go up to the top to see the beautiful, sparkling views of Hobart at night time. Mount Wellington lies directly behind Hobart and is the city's dominant feature. It is 1,270 metres high and was formed during the Permian, Triassic and Jurassic ages. The organ pipes are the predominant feature, named for both appearance and sounds produced by the wind. The Van Diemen's Land Aborigines were the first to see the mountain, calling it either Uyangahi or Oriontere. The first white man to record its existence was Lieutenant William Bligh in 1788. During early exploration, the mountain underwent many name changes, including Table Hill, Montagne de Plateau, Skiddaw, Mount Collins and Table Mountain after its similarity to Table Mountain, Cape of Good Hope. Between 1822 and 1824, it was renamed Mount Wellington after the Duke of Wellington. George Bass was the first white man to climb the mountain in 1798. I think in the early 1900s, about 1903, 1903 it was, it was proclaimed a park. So fortunately there's no uh, the you know, development is not allowed to be taken up there. Um, the only thing I would say, there's always controversy about putting up a, a restaurant on top of the, 
uh, pinnacle, quite apart from the cable car. Now, that may have merit as well. That's never happened because I think there's been a lot of protests about it. The mountain's greatest asset was water. Firstly, from the Hobart Rivulet, and later carried from mountain streams through an extensive system of aqueducts, pipelines, and reservoirs to supply the town below. For over a hundred years, Mount Wellington was exploited for its natural resources. Timber, stone, food, ice, skins, ferns, and seeds. Timber was the main commodity. Wattle, she-oak, stringy bark, and blue gum were all used for building and firewood. Tree ferns were cut down and used extensively for decoration that lined the streets and arches during the Royal Tour in 1901. Concern by conservationists and tourist promoters regarding denudation arose in 1870, but it was not until 1906 it was declared a public park. The cliffs, boulder fields, swamps and gullies provide diverse habitat for fauna and flora. During the 19th century, Mount Wellington became a mecca for botanists. A living fossil, Anaspedas tasmania, a tiny freshwater shrimp, was recorded in 1837. Examples of flora and fauna were sent to England for examination and classification. Many still bear the names of botanists who collected them. New discoveries continue to be made. Over 400 plant species are found on Mount Wellington, while 62 species of bird were recorded from 1976. Animal life is mainly nocturnal. Snakes, frogs and lizards are common during the day. Wellington, which is also known as Kunyani, is, as I understand it, a very spiritual place for our Aboriginal peoples. Um, and certainly they have a great tradition and history on that mountain as well, which they guard and protect very carefully. So any use of the mountain, we have to be very, very careful to make sure that uh, it, it's a good use and that our Aboriginal uh, cousins and friends and family are part of that discussion. Tasmania, we, we had a lot of explorers come to Tasmania and so of course I assume when they've seen things that look like something from home, they then wanted to name it or call it something different. We had the Dutch explorers, the French explorers, um, the British of course who really ultimately grabbed uh, Tasmania and turned it into a, a colony. Um, so I guess it's just very natural for explorers to want to name things after themselves or about places that they're familiar with from home. Well, Mount Wellington, in my opinion, adds to the beauty of Hobart itself. Hobart has to be one of the most beautiful cities in the world, geographically. You've not only got the, the base at the mountain, which is fairly flat, and a lot of ribbon development out towards the north, but you have the, the most beautiful waterway called the River Doon and uh, then um, it, it's such an asset for recreational purpose for modern Tasmanians and of course it's such a, an asset for visitors. I mean everyone that comes here you know they usually have a trip up to the mountain so the, the impact on Tasmania has been enormous and the beauty of it uh, much more when I was a boy actually it was always covered during winter in snow. This year we've had some good examples of it as well because it's been pretty cold this winter. But uh, in my way of thinking, when I was growing up, there was a lot more snow there. Mount Wellington is um, a really uh, incredible thing to have on your doorstep as a capital city. Uh, to be able to get up the mountain within half an hour or so, to be on the beach in the sunshine. But unlike uh, perhaps 
our northern friends. Um, it's unique in its beauty, probably the only, well with its harbour and its mountains and um, it, it's, and once you get up there of course it's a grand view and uh, that's been going on now, you know, for well, 200 years. And the fact that it has been looked after and protected and kept wild and free for so long. At the moment, um, there's a lot of debate around access to the mountain. I've always said, and I think my family would agree with me, that free and open and safe access for all people is really at the heart of what makes Mount Wellington very precious and very special to, to all Tasmanians. The mountain certainly adds to its beauty, uniqueness, its attraction. Uh, look, I'm a Hobartian and uh, uh, it's my city. Uh, I don't want to live anywhere else. But it is, it has to be one of the most beautiful cities. I, I flew over Hobart um, not so long ago in a helicopter and uh, I made the comment there, it's got to be one of the most beautiful cities. Mount Wellington has a vivid history. It has been devastated by fire and flood. The scar of a major landslip is clearly visible. It has provided sites for weather stations, AUSSATs, bath station, and telecommunication facilities. Recreational purposes have included bushwalking, foot racing, cliff climbing, and sightseeing. Many huts were built on the mountain and by the 1930s a network of tracks existed. The mountain was also popular with skiers, but lost favour when the snow became unreliable. The Pinnacle Road opened in 1937, enabling easy access to the top. Mount Wellington continues to be Hobart's major tourist attraction, offering spectacular panoramic views of the city, river, land and sea below. Um, access for those who don't want to travel by road, that's a debate that's happening at the moment. And what I would say is that it really doesn't matter what other forms of access people want to propose, we need to keep the road safe, open, maintained and up to date so that all people can use that mountain. When the bushfires swept through Hobart and the mountain, that was more the era of my dad. And we have photographs uh, in our family uh, of those bushfires coming right down to the top of Mount Stewart. And they actually happened in the year I was born. So it's really incredible to think that we have that much wilderness and bush on our very doorstep so that a, a fire like that could really come down so close to where people, people are living. Shortly after the 1967 fire, the Canine Defence League began feeding the starving animals on the mountain. Among the group were two Hobart residents, Mrs G Smith and Mrs Jasmine Lawrence, who, over four months, carried buckets of donated food, grain, carrots, apples and bread to checkpoints all over the eastern face of the mountain. This was done until the plants began to shoot and the animals once again had food. How's it formed? 
How is Mount Wellington formed? What a great question. So I'm not a scientist, but my understanding is that it was actually a volcano originally. And so when you see the organ pipes and, and the, I think it's dolerite, hopefully I'm correct, the, the rock formation that comes up the middle, that was actually part of the core of a volcano. And I, I also believe, hopefully I'm correct in this as well, that that, that uh, chain of volcanoes was part of the same chain that formed New Zealand. So that it actually becomes one under the sea, you can see it's one um, plate where the two plates meet. So I think that's very interesting to know that because that would have happened millions and millions and millions of, of years ago. But it gives us its character. Black Tuesday, 1967. Many factors led to the disaster. Among them were extreme weather conditions of high temperatures and strong wind gusts, a good spring growth of grace, the steep slopes of the mountain and the accumulation of forest fuel also contributed to the extensive and rapid transformation of the scenery. Bushfires. One of the most memorable and devastating bushfires of all was that of 7th February 1967. The following page from the Mercury, 9th of February 1967, graphically describes the events of that Black Tuesday. The fire left charred and bare tree trunks across the face of the mountain. In places the intensity of the fire was so great that all that remained were massive dead tree trunks from previous fires. The 1967 fire reduced the Springs Hotel to a pile of rubble and twisted iron. A few remains of the hotel are still visible a short walk up the hill behind the picnic area. A description of the day's events outlined in the report on 1967 bushfire presented by the Solicitor General. 3pm. The communication system throughout Hobart was disrupted. 3.30pm. The direction of the wind has changed to the west and the fire from Sleeping Beauty was moving rapidly along the mountain and it reached the Springs Hotel, which was burnt to the ground. The people sheltering near Fern Tree Hotel were evacuated to Hobart via the Hewan Highway through dense smoke and with scrub and timber still burning on both sides of the road. By the 1870s, timber milling had denuded the slopes of Mount Wellington. Residents voiced their concerns about the destruction to the vegetation and removal of man ferns for the decoration of Hobart's shops and streets. One such outburst was recorded in the Mercury in 1876. We have a lot of tourists who come to visit and there's certainly pressure on the road and buses and cars that want to go up there. And the road is closed when, it, when there's heavy snow. People get very anxious about that. Do you know what, I think that's part of the charm, that it's not always accessible. That actually you have to pick your times and mountain has, has moods and seasons and sometimes it's snowing so much that you can't go to the top. So I think it's a, it's a lovely thing that tourists want to come and see it, but I think we always have to remember that the local use and the people of Tasmania treat um, the mountain with a great deal of care and love as our mountain. In 1901, tree ferns growing in the wet gullies of the mountain were used to decorate the streets of Hobart for the Duke of York's visit and the Federation celebrations. The mountain landscape has not always looked as it does today. Slow processes such as weathering have made slight changes, while landslips, flooding and bushfires have resulted in sudden and dramatic transformations, often hastened by careless and ignorant human intervention. No other force has changed the appearance of Mount Wellington more quickly, dramatically and more often than bushfires. Early explorers reported the fires burning in the Derwent area probably lit by the Aboriginal population of the southeast. However, since European settlement, the severity of the uncontrollable fires has increased the frequent loss of life and property. The effects of these fires are visible long after the event. On the 4th of June, 
1872, a massive landslide occurred on Mount Wellington above Glenorchy. One year later, the Mercury printed a report by Mr. Winter, a geologist employed to report on the cause of the Great Landslip. This is part of the account of what he saw. The colony of Tasmania was visited by the heaviest rainfall that has taken place since the flood in 1854. Upon the rain ceasing, I started for the scene of the catastrophe, a striking contrast to the surrounding locality, in being completely denuded of the dense and gigantic vegetation. On the riverside, a terribly weird and wild scene presented itself. The scar of this 1872 landslip can still be seen on the northern slopes of Mount Arthur. So when it comes to the temperature of Mount Wellington and how cold it can be, um, I think you know it can get down below zero, obviously. And when, when the winds from Antarctica come up, we can feel that chill, you get the sleet and the snow. And even as we talk today, I know that um, the snow has come down to a very low level, I think down to 200 metres. Because I live in South Hobart, of course, we see the, the snow settling on the grass. And at times there have been really icy blasts where it's gone down well below zero, perhaps even to minus 10, and snow has settled even as far as in Newtown. And the kids get a snow day and they get a day off school. So it's a, it's a lovely time, it's freezing cold. My great uncle and my grandfather um, were elected to Parliament and they ran the Labor government here in the 1930s during the Great Depression. And the biggest issue that we had then, the biggest issue we have now, is making sure that there's work for everybody. So they um, really were passionate about getting men employed and back into work. So they created these major projects, Keynesian Economics, and one of the major projects was to build this road up Mount Wellington. Hundreds of men employed on that project and I think it took about three years to build. Started um, in 34 and was officially opened in 37 by the governor. And that day of the opening when all the cars, and cars were fairly exciting and expensive things back then, when all the cars and the people of Hobart drove up the mountain for the first time and celebrated their arrival on the pinnacle. That was really a red letter day, an amazing thing. And to have shepherded this, shepherded this state through the Great Depression and kept everybody going, kept the families alive, people in school, kids in school, men in work, people fed, that was a remarkable achievement. We're very proud. The huts are the work of young fellows who spend their spare time in the bush. And they spare no pains in making their temporary dwellings pleasing to the eye and comfortable to inhabit. A study of Mount Wellington's flora after the 1967 bushfire noted that the fire did not produce significant long-term changes in the distribution of plant communities or their species composition. While some plants were slower to recover, the study recognised how vulnerable and also how adaptable native plants are to fire. The story of Mount Wellington will continue into the future. But as for now, Mount Wellington is one of Hobart's and Tasmania's greatest attractions.